Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Let's start so that I have some minutes of delay. The entrance in the city was a bit complex. Uh, I'll sp this morning, I'll, I'll, I'll have two talks. The first is about uh, academic writing and publishing and uh, journals. It will be related to the editorial um, aspects of uh, the research. And the second one, I'll go through systematic reviews, uh, meta-analysis, narrative reviews, and guidelines. Okay, so during the first uh, uh, speech, I'll talk about uh, journal metrics, uh, open access, quality of reporting. I'll give you some reference of books that you can use to improve the writing of your articles. And then I'll also speak about uh, the paper tactic. What is? is how to increase the chance that your papers will be accepted by top level journals, okay? And uh, uh, what's the background actually is of this uh, talk is that we have a huge investment in research. Um, you usually uh, can listen to people that compel about the founding of research, which is not really, really great and can be improved, particularly in countries like Italy, in which the total uh, amount of resources devoted to research is uh, less than 1% of uh, the gross internal product. But uh, overall, it's still a huge amount of money. The problem is that a lot of this money is not really, really mm, well invested because of problem of problems in the reporting. So it means that there is a poor reporting in the, uh, in the reporting of manuscripts. Over 30% of child's intervention, the intervention is not sufficiently described. So it means that it cannot be replicated on, uh, in practice. Uh, over 50% of plan study outcomes are not reporting, and this is the selective outcome reporting bias, which is part of the publication bias. And uh, most uh, research are not interpreted in the context of systematic assessment of other relevant evidence. It means that every single study is a piece that doesn't take into account the other evidence in that field. And uh, why it is important to publish, apart because we want to make a good use of research, it is because it's a key aspect of your, of your career. So publishing, explain, okay, it's mostly predictable and explain the, uh, is a predictor of your career. So as much as you publish, then as much are the probability, the chance that your career will be increases up to a top uh, level. And usually it depends by the number of publications, the impact factor of the journals, and uh, that is important. The number of citations your paper receives, okay, compare to the average, okay, for the journals in which they were published. So this is uh, the number of the citation of your paper, this is the impact factor of the journal, okay? And this ratio gives you an idea about how good is your research compared to the other average research that is published in a journal, okay? If you are a top researcher, you will be, okay, with this ratio pretty, pretty high. Then we have a problem with the gender, okay? Of course, uh, in country like in Italy and uh, in other country as well, there is a problem because female have less opportunity. So there is not a really, really a balance between the carriers, uh, between males and uh, females. And it's kind of uh, sex means applied also to research field, okay? And uh, the rank of uh, your University. So there are like, uh, although publication explain a lot of the variability of the phenomenon, okay, it is also the university where you come from that play a role in the academic hiring process. Okay, if you have any questions, please interrupt me. Okay, we will be, uh, we will have a bit more of interaction. Okay, so this is uh, the, 
the different countries, okay, and uh, you see the level of uh, publication, the number of uh, scientific and te technical journal articles that are published. Here you have Italy. Italy is at the eighth ranking place for number of publication and journal. So that's not so bad, actually. It performs well, okay. Of course, the United States is the first. There are emerging countries like China that are growing quite quickly, but Italy, it has a really good productions in terms of quantity, okay? So we, as a community of researchers, we publish a lot, okay? And these are the absolute number. Here at the top, you have United States. Here you have Italy, and you have like countries like UK, Japan, or France. You can see that France is just a bit higher than us. And what you can see is that the number is pretty stable. What it means? It means that once that you uh, establish a research pipeline, the number of articles, they just are stable over a long period. And that's true also for researchers. So while at the beginning it's difficult to get your paper published, then one in the long run, then it's much more easier to have a certain number of paper published every year. And all these papers, okay, they get published somewhere in journals. So we will try to see which are the journals that pick up most of these contributions. Okay, the problem is that the problem is that the quantity, okay, doesn't reflect the quality of the papers. And this is the problem that we will see we have in uh, Italy. And quality actually matters. Okay, so this is a, a a paper by Matarese published in 2008. I think that still most of these uh, um, uh, results apply now. And uh, Matarese compared the characteristic of all Italian research journals and a selection group of UK research journals. And here are compare some of the characteristics of these journals. Of course, you have difference for the, for the language, but uh, uh, there are other facts that are important. You can see here the International Editorial Board. So UK journals are much more international compared to the Italian journals. Okay. The type of articles, if you see the number of RCTs, uh, okay, the percentage compared to the number of clinical trials, UK journals are performing quite well. Why? the Italian journals, they fell a bit short. So it means that if you have a randomized trials, the chance that these will be submitted to the Italian journals are quite small compared to the UK journals. It means that some country is more attractive in terms to get the best research that is usually performed in different countries. And then you have a different uh, index uh, like Shimego, okay, well, there are not many um, huge differences, although if you see the H index, uh, it may be like a, a difference. So the, the median in the H D index, and then I'll go through the, some of these metrics over in the, in, in the lectures. Yeah, like uh, the UK journals perform quite well, and you can see that the p-value of most of the comparison are uh, significant. Uh, in this slide, you have another comparison between the T journals and the UK. Here, you have a group of reporting guidelines. What are these reporting guidelines? These guidelines are recommendations in how to submit and which information you should provide with your papers. Okay, and as you can see, the number of Italian journals that adopt these editorial requirements are nil, okay? While the UK journals, they, in some cases, they provide uh, these guidelines and they ask to the authors to comply with these recommendations. Uh, that means that you have 
a much stronger communities in terms of the type of reporting that should be adopted and the papers usually match these high quality standards okay so these are differences in the quality and then you have the part related to the conflict of interest okay and here you have uh, a number of uh, uh, variables uh, that explain the differences between the Italian and the UK journals. You have the language, you have the international editorial board, the size, so the number of articles per year, the percentage of articles with the international authorships, okay, and these explain a lot of the variability between the Italian and the UK journals. So in conclusions, uh, UK journals are really international. So, and these are key elements while you submit your research. So if you want to increase the chance of your papers to be published in a high impact journals, which would be a UK based or America based or US based, then be international, okay? Italian journals are smaller and score lower for quality than UK journals, okay? So what's about this uh, quality? Adopt the consort or the quorum that now is called Prisma or the, uh, the Arrive if you have an animal studies, whatever reporting guidelines that you can say in your papers that you adopted and the reporting is in accordance to these. Uh, editorial leaderships, okay, means editors is uh, really associated with the journal quality. So while you increase uh, your number of publications, try to be linked and connected to editors, okay? It is important that while you go to meetings, you meet with the editors and you try to connect with them, okay? And we will see why it is important, okay? And all these will improve the reporting uh, and uh, will increase the chance of your papers to be then connected to high quality journals, okay? Now, I have a few slides in Italian. I know that some of you uh, are from other countries, so I will try to explain most of uh, these uh, in, uh, in English. How to select the, the journal. This is an important moment. You worked a lot okay, in your paper, and then you have these moments in which you have really to select the journals. So how usually do you decide which is the right journal for your paper? Which are the key elements in making this decision that you adopt, actually? How many of you submitted the papers to a journal, actually? Quite a few, okay. So why, like, which were the factors that drove your decision? It was your choice or it was the choice of another co-author first? Who decided? You or maybe like a senior? The senior, okay. <laughs> okay, so now let's, okay, so if it's not your choice, it's the choice of some, somebody else. What was a key aspect that you can guess about his or her decision? The topic of the papers that match the topic of the journal. Like if you have a paper about uh, a, a liver enzyme, then you go to liver diseases as a journal.
Okay, so you think about five journals that match your papers in terms of uh, topic. Okay, Did I, yeah, okay, so the topic, the field of interest, then you have the, f the five, and how these five were selected. Okay. Okay, so it's the quality of the journal and the quality of your paper. The quality, the two qualities should match, okay? But it's all, is it true that, uh, you know, like uh, Nature always publish really high quality papers? No, oh, huh. so. Hmm. Okay, so and you mentioned quite of the key aspects in the selection of the journal. So now let's try to uh, organize a bit uh, them. So first, uh, you decide uh, with the uh, with the topic. You cannot publish on uh, uh, like a, unless uh, if you're going at very very general journals in which the quality of your paper is just um, assessed. But uh, you know, like these are very, very general journal, like uh, for instance, uh, plus one, okay, in which you have uh, it's a big, big folder in which everything can be published. So usually, you have a match between your paper and the topic, okay. Then you say that you look at the impact factor. Well, it's okay. The impact factor is a value that provides you some information about the quality of the journal not the quality of your paper, but the quality of the journal, okay? And uh, what's the journal that has the highest impact factor? In medicine, which is the journal that has the highest impact factor? If impact factor is a key aspect in your choice, I assume that you know, uh, no. New England. Okay, so that has an impact factor of around 52. And why it is possible that this journal has an impact factor of 52? Also immunology. But it has, it's simple because it publishes all the randomized trials of new drugs. Okay, it's really conservative journals that publishes all the randomized trials. So you see randomized trials, they go to American journals, classic one. Okay, impact factor, very important. Editorial board, it's important. But why people usually, your senior authors, look at the editorial board? Because there should be the friends, of course, okay. So, and that's why you may, if you are, if you do not take some freedom in selecting the journals, you will be always a hostage of the friends of your senior, okay, author. That's why you need to start also to move across different publications. Otherwise, you, in your CV, you will have just two or three journals. And people will say, mm, is this publishing because it's good research or because it has friends on the editorial board, okay? And uh, impact factor is also important in p countries like Italy because uh, there may be some payback for the institutions if you publish in high 
impact factor journals. So the institution will get some economical financial benefit, okay, which means that it has some relevance also at the level systems. Then you say that you match the quality of your papers with the quality of the journals, but it's true that uh, in, um, important journals publish, you know, like really bad research, and it's true the opposite. Particularly, you should consider your age. If you have really, really a good paper, really good quality, but you are very, very young, and you publish in immunology, it will be really difficult. Okay, so cut your teeth. As much as you are younger, you have to start with journals that have a low impact factors, and then you will increase during your careers. And that's eventually possible that your papers will be accepted but uh, you may be asked to remove your name from the papers. Why? Because in some journals, the papers should be signed by experts. If you are not considered an expert, if your CV is not strong enough, and you have the seniors, then the journal can ask to you know the juniors the, to be selectively take it out from the authorships. This happens with the New England, for instance. So if you have really, really good, good papers, okay, think about if it's the case to go for these type of journals because they want to maintain a clear authorship with leaders, which is one of the factors that really, really uh, um, is distinctive of uh, high impact factor journals, okay? So he's going to publish there, okay? So you have several, several elements in deciding the, um, the journals uh, and uh, tell me. You can publish a trial. Okay, you can publish an experiment, but you cannot publish uh, an expert review. Okay. So, if you have, like, even if you have a narrative reviews, okay, and you have two seniors, and you are a junior in between, Okay, you may be asked to remove your name from the authorship. Okay, even if you are, why? Because uh, it's these journals, okay, are based on experts and they check the experience of the people that is going to submit the paper, okay? If you work with the strong groups, okay, you increase your chance, of course, but I, I have at least a couple of friends that works in uh, strong groups uh, that were asked to remove the name. And then the decision is that to change the journal, usually, because your senior, if they are okay, uh, honest, okay, they would then uh, select another journalist. But the editors, in principle, is saying, I am going to accept the papers on on these journals, but I'm not going to accept everyone that you are proposing, okay? That's also why uh, now some journals, okay, for some type of research are starting to decrease the number of authors that you can have in the authorships. So there is a, an, uh, systems that push, okay, the authors to decrease the number of co-authors. Okay. This is just, I'm not saying I'm not providing you any type of judgment about this. I leave to you the judgment about this type of uh, editorial conduct. Okay. So if you are, tell me.
well, in Italy, even if you have the regulation, nobody applies. So, we are. <laughs> no, in Italy, we don't have this type of, uh, although your paper, the paper in your CVs, in the national health systems, uh, you have some evaluations that depends on the position that you have on the authorships uh, and the number of uh, uh, researchers from one institution uh, that you have in the authorships. So it means that uh, as far as you have at least three authors from one institution, the institutions get recognitions for these papers. And, uh, uh, but it's, I'm not saying that is uh, uh, is totally unhelpful. The fact that you have some limits in the authorships, what it's is that you have a fixed rule, while it should be much more rational to have a be like uh, to have a, uh, a rule such as uh, you know 50% of your papers should be written should be written with authorship of less than 10 authors. Okay, which means that, uh, you know, the system is try to push you to balance your portfolio of publications, but also includes, and you have a reward for uh, co-authorships in large research group. Actually now, most of the big, big grants, they go for networking at the European level, for instance, uh, and so these type of papers, they have usually authorships of, you know, like maybe even 100 researchers. But these are large scientific enterprise and, uh, you know, like a country should be proud to have uh, its own researchers on board, uh, while these type of fixed rules uh, doesn't, you know, like uh, doesn't respect these uh, type of really high quality research. So I think that is the problem is how fixed is the rule here, okay? If so my suggestion is that in your CV, you should also try to have papers in which you show a clear role in uh, uh, scientific uh, and uh, mm, in scientific uh, uh, enterprise. So while maybe sign once every while a paper alone or maybe in tandem with another researchers, so you show a clear capacity of productions of uh, ideas and uh, um, how you know you deal with research, okay? So that is, is important that you have a high variable CV with different type of publication, okay? So while you are young, okay, you have to select the journals and it's important that you select the journals that uh, match the quality Okay, or maybe is a bit. Uh, usually, young researchers they try to publish in really high impact factor journals, so there is a mismatch. While well, my suggestion is that you try at the beginning inverting. Okay, so you try with low quality journals compared to the quality of your papers. Why? That's my suggestion. Why I say this? All right. It doesn't make sense, you know, like you work for maybe two or three years, finally you have your papers, Is the paper is really high quality, and then I suggest, okay, go for a low quality journal. Yes, yes, the time lag bias. Okay, the fact that you start to be known are important factors. So it's more, much more important that you get the paper published and then the paper has the opportunity to be cited and then you will get the recognitions and we will be after the publication that you try to push uh, before the publication. So it is important that you try to reverse particularly beginning while after a while you can say, okay, I'm submitting 10 papers Okay, this it will be submitted to these journals, even if I lose uh, one year in trying to get the paper published at these, uh, with, with these uh, high, really um, uh, high impact factor journals, is not a problem. But if you have one paper and you fight for two years to get the paper published, you are losing two years, okay? So that is a problem. The other problem is that the peer review with uh, 
a journal that is uh, high reputable, it's much more difficult. So if you don't have a strong experience in the peer review process while you know, fighting with uh, uh, a nightmare committee, it will be a bit hard. Do you know what is the, do you know what are the key steps uh, in when you submit your, is it, is it okay if, okay, so uh, I just move on, okay. Did you cover also the cover letters, the, the Hammer Committee, the peer review, all these aspects, okay. Okay, so and did you also speak about uh, the bibliometrics uh, indicators? This afternoon, okay. So I'll be in factor immediacy index. So this is important for young researchers, okay. Look uh, at the immediacy index, uh, which means uh, how quick is usually an article on that journal in receiving in receiving citations okay so when you want when you are really really young you want get you want to get easily okay and quickly citations okay so this is the indicator that gives you the idea about the speed of citations of a journal okay why these okay decided half life so like how long is the life of a paper in terms of citations, it's more important in the long period. So if New England has a, new, a high impact factors, it means that the impact factors just measure the first two years, okay? The first two years of the publications in the journals. It means that that is like fashion. It's a trials, okay, you have a boost in the citations, and then maybe nobody, everyone forgets about these papers, okay? So this uh, gives you the idea in which how long is the period in which the paper is cited and the journal that has the best cited half-life is not the New England, which is the best journal for the cited half-life. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm mostly a clinical on the clinical side. So in science and natures, I'm I'm not sure they will they can have a, a huge sided half life. But um, methodology they get a lot, a lot of publication. Yes, that's true. That's the feed that usually get you know like a huge, huge half life. But the journal actually is the BNJ. Okay, so it's in the long run, it gets more and more citations, okay. I hope that you will cover also some of these experts about how to organize the journals to select, okay. And uh, just to have a bit of chat about the cover letters, which is how you present your papers. So. What are the key experts of a cover letter? What you have to say in the cover letter? Interesting, uh, okay. So the editor is inter do you have a really to replicate what you have in your papers, like the same type of approach? So you say the main findings and you will copy and paste from the upshot of the, no, okay. So what do you say? Yes, uh, yeah, but there are like some other key elements that he's uh, think about the editor. The letters goes uh, to the editor, okay? And the editor has some idea about his journal, his or her journals, but he may have, you know, like some ideas, not really a good idea. So you have to match your papers against what has been published 
on that journals in the last two years. And you can say, you already published 10 papers about these topics, so this is really your journal is the home of these type of papers. Okay, and this is when you match the field of the papers with the field of the journals. Otherwise, you may say to the journals, okay, you just published last time a paper about these topics, okay, three years ago. And I think, and that's my suggestion, that from time to time it's good to, you know, like publish easy, even though it's not your favorite topics in the journal. And then you have also to push your papers saying, you know, like which can be the impact. The, not really the, the the research findings, but what can be the research, the, 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 the impact, uh, okay, so it's going to be taken by guidelines, by recommendations in guidelines, so write down these uh, findings, it will be then, okay, of clear usage for panelists uh, that works uh, in, uh, uh, in providing recommendations, okay and why the editor wants to see this uh, type of uh, statement. Because uh, he or she will have an idea about the impact uh, that the paper will, be, will have uh, once it's going to be published. Okay, so these are key elements that you should uh, provide. Okay, and I, I see that now uh, journal have uh, an uh, the overload in terms of publications, uh, it's quite increased uh, during the, the last years. So if you see the number of publications is increasing over time. So cover letters uh, were, like in the past, were very long, uh, one or two pages, quite often two pages, okay? Very, very long addressing all the points of the papers. When you submit your papers, how much time does the editor have to look at your paper? How? Uh, well, uh, let's be more optimistic, okay? Let's say that he has uh, five minutes, okay? And uh, the if you send the papers to like uh, journals that are at intermediate levels, your paper is not seen by the editors. Who is looking at your paper? You think that your paper is seen by the editor, but it's not seen really by the editor. No. The first one, you said, you, okay, you are, now you are on internet. Uh, you do all, you know, the upload uh, and everything, okay? It takes a while. After one day, finally, you arrive at the last page and you are ready to make, you know, uh, this is your final submission. Are you ready? Okay, and you go. Okay, then the paper, where it goes? If it's uh, to the sister. <laughs> no, not to the sister, usually to an assistant. Okay, and the assistant just checks, okay, has a checklist uh, and it checks if the papers has everything, okay. So, at that level, be sure that you comply with all the rules, okay. And uh, the assistant usually reads uh, the abstract, if the abstract uh, makes sense, okay, the paper will be then passed to the editor, okay. So, I will say, okay, please take a look at this. Then you have the editors. The editors starts usually from the cover letter, okay? So from the cover letter, he decides or she decides if to go to the abstracts and then reads the abstracts, okay? Usually this is the process. Then while five minutes, it will be decided if rejecting or not the paper. If the decision is, hmm, I wanna further evaluate the, the article, then it will move a bit on the article, okay? Before to take the decisions, if to send the paper to peer reviewers or not, okay? So this is important, the abstract and the cover letter. These are the most important part of your papers, okay? Because, because they get, you know, they improve the chance to get revised by the peer reviewers. And use the ballot points then. 
because editors get a lot, a lot of stuff now, be sure to okay, in the cover letter touch what are really the key aspects of your paper. So use it, ballot points, okay, very well written cover letter, but quite okay, uh, quite short. Open access. Uh, you did not mention open access journals in the decisions. What are open access journals? Exactly. Where now you there is always payment. Where the payment is moved? <laughs> uh, yes, it's the researcher actually that has to pay. So. Uh, you have to think that these uh, journals, okay, they stay on the market, okay, and so they have to be sold to someone. In the past, the model was, uh, I have a journal, okay, I present the journal to the libraries of hospitals, of academic institutions, and the institutions will buy my journals and will have access to the contents, okay. Then we started to have a big consortia of uh, journals. Uh, but finally, this assistance was uh, uh, really criticized because, uh, because uh, there were mm, the, same, the same good was uh, paid two times by the systems. It was paid at the beginning when the National Health Institute paid for the research and then it was paid a second time uh, to get access to the same content that was already founded by the country or by the institutions. So there was this system that was pushed in which uh, you pay to publish your research, okay? And uh, the editors, okay, the publisher really, not the editor, the publisher, okay, ask you to for a fee and the fee covers the cost for the production of the papers and for the paper to be pushed to all people. Okay, now the question is, is it good, is it a good option to publish in open access journal or, yeah, why? Uh, yes, uh, yes, in principle, uh, but then in reality, is it true or not? Think about Lancet or the New England. Are they open access? Okay, and now open access journals are, you know, like in the market since at least uh, uh, 13 years ago. And, uh, you know, like uh, these big journals that uh, you have to pay for see the contents, uh, they have still more and more citations. Yeah. So they, I mean, if you go probably for low intermediate journals, uh, then it's true that open access journals can get a bit more of citations, but it's not true for the, yes, for the top levels, okay? Then you have uh, another options that I would like just to mention. You have two types of open access. The, the classic open access of what is called uh, the, um, the gold road, okay, in which you publish to journals. So you ask a journalist to publish your contents, uh, your manuscript, uh, and then you will pay and it will be published on a journal. Or you can have mixed systems in which your manuscript will be published on uh, uh, folders on the uh, web page of your institutions, okay, or on these uh, type of uh, mm, um, of uh, mm, registers of results, for instance, okay? And uh, um, you may be interested in publishing, okay? Uh, how can I say? Let's say uh, if you have a starting work uh, about uh, a possible future paper, okay? And this is uh, a kind of, uh, has not the quality of a manuscript, okay? but it has some scientific merits. Okay, it's not really, really high. So what's about this? In the past, there was no chance to publish this type of work, but now you can try to publish in some repository of institutions, and then you can mention as a starting point of your future papers, okay? 
So green and gold roads, okay, and the two publications, so the one that has really a value on your CVs are the one that are published on journals uh, and uh, uh, these, uh, this is now increased, these percentages, uh, but it's still you know, like a minority part of the journals, although you now have a big, big uh, publisher that uh, have uh, a huge number of uh, titles that increase somehow the percentage of open access journals and the op or and papers that are published in open access. Uh, have you ever heard about a uh, publisher like uh, uh, Indawi, Page Press, uh, uh, there are quite a few others, okay. Uh, I have a document that I'm not, I didn't put on your slides, but you have to pay attention to some of these journals, okay. Because some of these journals, you just submit the paper, the paper that is taken and published, okay. Uh, but you have like a good journals and you have also black list of journals that uh, researchers avoid, okay because it means that you are kind of uh, taking advantage of the fact that they publish everything. So, and there is now someone that starts to ask uh, that uh, as we value in CV publication in a uh, high impact factor journals, which you downsize the These type of journals now your papers. Okay. Any questions about open access journals? How many of you are thinking to publish in PLOS One or did in the past? Have you ever published in? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. What's, uh, have you ever heard about PLOS One? Okay, would you consider that's a good journal? Yes. Why it is a good journal? It has a good impact factor, uh, which is uh, free something. Okay, three point three point four. Okay, thank you, Marcello, or something like this. So it's a good impact factor. So somehow you are making the interest of your colleagues that want to access to your papers if you publish in PLOS One because it's open access and so there is uh, the freedoms and the rights to download, also to reuse your data, your figures. So everyone is free to reuse uh, uh, as far as you know, like there is a recognition of the intellectual property of your papers and is cited there is the opportunity to reuse, okay? So that's perfect, that's really, really social convenient. I totally agree. So that's a good fact of plus one. Are there only good experts? that are not so good. Okay. And 
Yeah, no, it's true. So the quality, okay, there is a large amount of papers. So there are like uh, thousands and thousands of papers, okay, close to 100,000, it was uh, a few time ago. Uh, the number of published articles, okay, every year. So it's a huge number of papers that are published, the quality there, so it, could, it should be highly var variable, okay. But the other fact is that usually these, these papers are not evaluated for the relevance. What it means, it means they are only evaluated for the methodology, okay, but not for the relevance. And the peer reviewers are asked to not evaluate the relevance of the papers. So it can be, you know, like a, the, the, the 10th times that an experiment has been conducted and you still are allowed to publish, okay, is replication because you don't evaluate uh, the newsworthiness, the relevance of the papers, just the quality if the experiment was good. Okay. Also the images should be good, but if, the, if they are not, um, it's, it's possible, then it's going to be published there. And the other problem is that you get, you, are, you don't have the match between the field and the journal. So it's much more difficult than to search in PLOS One, which are the important papers in your field, although there are now tag and ontology that helps a lot, okay? So, but if you want to be recognized as a, as a key researcher in a field, be sure that if you publish in PLOS One, you also publish in the journals that are recognized for the title as a really relevant in your field, really specific for your field, okay? So balance your portfolio. Any other question? You want to have a short break, just five minutes, or should I move on to the second part of the lecture? Okay. Uh, reporting. Here you have a few slides about the books uh, that can help you in the reporting of your papers. Okay. And you have. Uh, someone that is uh, freely available and here you have my comments about the how good is the source okay so you can take these uh. okay narrative and systematic revision of the literature meta-analysis and guidelines which should we choose and why anything else wow that's a long should be a long long lecture this one Okay, I'll try to move from narrative and systematic and systematic reviews, okay, as a first uh, part. Matrioska vision, okay, so like we have uh, all reviews, okay, they like it, they are in a folder which is the narrative reviews, and these are like the classic type of narrative review is the chapter of a book. Okay, that's the classic narrative reviews. Okay, and then they can also be published in journal, of course, as a manuscript. That you have a small sample, okay, within the larger sample of reviews that are systematic reviews, and then you have an even smaller samples that are the systematic reviews that have uh, meta analysis. Okay. And this is a classic example of a meta-analysis published in PLOS One, actually, okay? Oral anticoagulation therapy in air failure patients in sinus rhythm as systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Now, let's look only to these two lines, okay? If you have the narrative reviews of the same topic, what could be the title? This is the systematic reviews. If you do this, this is, yeah, the systematic. So if you do the narrative reviews of the same topic, what should be then the title? Uh, even less. It will be oral anticoagulation therapy, probably. Okay. So that's a, 
that's the system. While, while you move to a systematic approach, you start to define better what is the population intervention, the comparison, and the outcomes. While you have a narrative reviews, you just stay on you know, the treatments, and then you move on. Okay? And here you see there is the background, the methodology, and principal findings. Okay? And uh, you can see that this is a really, really an ideal, an ideal first meta-analysis to start if you never wrote uh, a systematic reviews this is really the good one because uh, you can see here okay you can these small figures okay here you have the number of studies all these uh, black uh, dots uh, are the number of studies and you have only four studies and why this is ideal as a systematic reviews because you deal with the uh, just a small heterogeneity okay and it's really really simple to put together four studies if you have uh, to put together 40 studies it will be much different okay so this is the outline of uh, um, a systematic reviews of the introduction the method the results i don't go through the discussion with strengths and limitation and conclusions okay and these are the some key elements this is the flow of the studies i think that you spoke a bit about search strategies and what are the outputs and this is the first pillar of a systematic reviews okay which is where you find the articles okay and which one were included in your interpretation okay in a narrative reviews okay this uh, is not usually part of a narrative reviews now even in narrative reviews the person usually the author says i you know looked in medline and uh, in embase maybe and so that's what i think about the paper that i found so what's the clear difference between a narrative reviews and a systematic reviews you know where you start from and uh, why in a narrative reviews we can still rely on the results of a narrative reviews. Because we think that the person that writes that paper is an expert, okay, is clearly, clearly an expert. So we rely on his knowledge of the topic, okay. And here you have the, the second aspect that makes a systematic reviews really systematic the quality assessment, okay? Every of these, okay, the sequence generation, allocation concealment, incomplete outcome data, and so on, these are all quality items that are evaluated for each single trials, okay? And you can see that there are green, okay, yellow, and red cycles, green are okay, Every time that you see, a, a, of course, a red, it means that there is a problem in the paper. Unclear what it means. That the quality item was usually not reported. Okay. So what's the difference between a narrative reviews and a systematic reviews? In the, the big difference is that in a narrative reviews, we do not evaluate usually the quality of the single component of the single studies while in a systematic reviews we are called to do a systematic search strategies and then a quality assessment of each single trials so in a narrative reviews where the authors usually speak about the quality of the paper Is something that is usually touched, is totally untouched, or? The limits, uh, uh, the limits of the review or the limits of the included articles? Uh, I think that uh, your answer is uh, really good for systematic reviews, okay? And in a good systematic reviews, you have uh, two types of limits. The limits that apply to the primary included studies, which are these, okay? 
and then the limits of the review itself. I searched only for English articles. So I did not look for articles in German, in Serbian, or in Italian. That is the limits of the review, okay? But then you have also the limitation of the single study. But this is usually something that you don't find in narrative review, okay? This part is usually the critics of the, the, the single trials. It's usually part of really of the writing of a narrative reviews. If you think about the narrative reviews, the it's usually it's divided in chapter as well it is the systematic reviews. The first part is the part about the incidence and the prevalence of the disease. So why the disease is important. In that sense, it really overlaps with systematic reviews. Okay. And then if you take uh, the narrative reviews of uh, the New England Journal, did you have you ever seen the articles that in New England are labeled as a review and then it starts you know like to have all a bunch of information about a disease like this one oral anticoagulation therapy then at the beginning it has uh, you know the part about the incidence and the prevalence then what's the second part in this uh, type of narrative reviews in the new england it's always the same eh? nothing changes really It will go on the animal studies. It will go on basic science. Okay, it will provide you some elements about uh, why the drugs uh, may act uh, and why it is good. Okay, then it will move on in the second part about trials in human. Okay, and there you will have some critics about the studies that have been conducted. Okay characteristic of studies that usually you don't have in narrative reviews, okay? And here we have the meta-analysis, okay? And this is a clearly simple meta-analysis, okay? Endpoint, efficacy, death, and here you have the safety and all are plot in the same forest plot, okay? You have the odds ratio, number of events in control, okay, warfarin, aspirins, and you have all the number of events, okay, and the denominators. Here you have the odds ratio reported in numbers, and here he is graphically display, okay, uh, for each one for each outcomes, uh, and the p-value referring to the endpoint uh, and to the heterogeneity of the overall analysis. Okay, so in uh, only one picture, you can collapse uh, all the information that are key in uh, a problem. Would you use these type of pictures in a narrative review? Why not? To write a narrative review, you need exactly the same type of information. You need to know about these endpoints. There are the endpoints that matters. So the core, the data that you have in a narrative review, okay, are not really different from the data that you have in a systematic reviews, okay? It's just that in a systematic reviews, these are provided on a structures, on a structural reports. The narrative reviews is again a structure paper although it's much more, uh, um, uh, it's much more in a presented on a, a um, classic storyboard in which you start from the beginning, okay, you mix all the stories, but the core contents are these, okay, and then you just start to see about each of these outcomes and the studies which are important. So this element is exactly the core of both a, an out, uh, a narrative and a systematic uh, reviews. And you can also publish this type of uh, pictures in a narrative reviews, okay? It's not really, really a problem because then it will be the core elements. You can take from another reviews or you can do yourself, okay? And uh, uh, otherwise, what you have uh, is a narrative reviews without uh, these uh, Synthesis, 
that is a narrative reviews of low quality. So what's the difference? The narrative reviews doesn't mean that you don't pull together the results of the studies. Okay, if you just speak about each studies as a single element, but you don't synthesize them together, okay, is a narrative reviews that is uh, uh, jeopardized, that is parcellar, okay, so that has uh, all the single studies as single elements, but if you collapse these in the overall synthesis, that you still have these as the, the core elements. Any questions? Is that clear? Okay. So now we are moving to work on the different elements to go for, you know, like a, a type of narrative reviews. Okay. And you see how you can then change the title. You can have these a nice label as a call for actions. But you have the systematic reviews here after the second part, you have the type of design. Okay. And here you have some of the elements that we, we talk, uh, the outline, so you can see the outline of the different of the different model. Uh, this model is about uh, the narrative reviews. You see no formal introduction of uh, incidence and prevalence, physio physiopathology, the intervention, the evidence, randomized control trials, systematic reviews and meta-analysis, clinical recommendation from these type of publication, the new oral anticoagulants and the conclusion that is a call for action. This is the classic template for uh, clinical narrative reviews. Why it is important to publish a narrative reviews in your CV? Is that more important to publish systematic reviews or narrative review? The systematic. Eh? Why the systematic? Eh? Okay, you show that you reanalyze the data. You have a, it's considered the narrative review is that considered a really scientific paper, a really scientific enterprise? Not really. So it's not an original article. Okay. An original article is a systematic review, but not a narrative review. Uh, so you say that is more important. It's more important because it gets more citation, a systematic review. Yeah, sure. It gets more meta-analysis, it gets more citations, okay? But why is it also important to have a narrative review? Yes, that's exactly. You will be recognized as an expert then. That's exactly. If you, if you publish a lot of systematic reviews, okay, you may be part of a team that publish a lot of systematic reviews. Okay, if you publish then a narrative reviews, you will be recognized as an expert. Okay, so that's why important to balance in your CV the different aspects. Okay, and this is the classic template of a narrative reviews. Okay, four types of narrative reviews, editorials, commentaries, overview articles. Okay, and this is, okay, the real type of narrative reviews and for books overview chapters. Okay. What's about editorial commentaries? Okay, these are principle, okay, like narrative reviews, but they are usually focused on some other research. And uh, if you will be asked to write an editorial for Annals of Internal Medicine, again, the structure of the editorial is pretty standardized. So do not think that you have to write whatever new the structure of the editorial can be a really, really a style exercise in which you follow the rules, the different paragraphs, and at the end you will have uh, the standard editorial. There are few editorial that are different, but usually these are written by kind of uh, also eclectic people. Otherwise, what you are called to do is just to write the academic editorial. 
okay and uh, these uh, are the narrative reviews okay these are different type of title you see that they are really really general the epidemiology of soccer injuries uh, Yaga yoga plus melatonin in metastatic cancer patient a case control study this is not really related I don't know why it is there <laughs> okay narrative characteristic sorry here you have a, ser uh, a series of uh, rules uh, about these uh, the narrative uh, pitfalls uh, okay uh, which are the elements that makes a narrative reviews uh, a really kind of weak type of publication. Personal opinions, okay, if you have a strong personal opinion, okay, and you want to introduce in a narrative reviews, you have to clearly separate your opinion for the interpretation of the evidence. So how you can get in a paragraph, you can say this is my opinion, but it should be clearly separated by the Others by the uh, rest of the article. Other opinions, okay. And uh, uh, another thing that is a pitfall is to use a huge number of references, okay. While because one of the mm, elements that makes important a narrative reviews is that it clearly show what are the key references in a field. So you need to be really, really selective about citing only what is really, really relevant in a field. You don't want to have a narrative reviews with a huge number of citations. Okay, tips. Narrative reviews usually do not present methods, but I like when there is a short method sections that can be proposed, okay? So the source is employed to find the literature, okay? And uh, if you use mixed methods or explicit criteria, well, then provide just shortly the readers this type of information. It will be still as a narrative reviews, okay? Sub subjectivities, okay? It's good, actually. If you make that explicit, it's good. Interpretation and synthesis usually focus on major differences between the studies in terms of clinical experts that maybe are, you know, elements that in a systematic reviews are more differing, and uh, do not rely on research design because this is usually something that happens in systematic reviews. Okay, refine the topic and be broader than in systematic reviews. So you need to have a really, really a broad goal. Select what is relevant, and reader, readers will be thankful, and this is also true for the references, okay? Oh, that's really an important topic. A areas of disagreements and discordances in literature. That's something that you really should highlight in uh, narrative reviews. Uh, the readers want to read about disputes, and also the editor will be pleased to publish something that has a lot to deal with disputes. Why? Because these are considered hot topics. So if you have a narrative reviews, search for the topics in which you have some conflicts among the authors, and then and then take your position, okay? Do not you know, be a really in between, but take your position. It will be your subjectivity. It's true everyone will recognize, but take uh, our positions. It will help also the readers to decide if the reader agrees or not with you, okay? Structures, still use structures also in a narrative reviews, and if you are a novice, write using good, good methods. Where you find these good methods? In some of the books, and the other option is that you can take courses in academic writing. What happens in a course about academic writing?
what's the difference between a course like this one and a course uh, that uh, you know like it's focused mostly on academic writing that you write actually okay so you have like the, you usually most of the lectures are not about these type of lectures but are lectures in which you get assignment you have to write uh, and then you are your writing is revised by editors that provide you then tips uh, and suggestion about how to improve the reporting of your paper okay this is the relative citation impact of various type of design and uh, meta analysis uh, received more citation than any other study design both in 91 and 2001 i have no more recent data but i would say that uh, uh, probably now okay it may be a bit different why because uh, meta analyses are a bit on a declining phases okay just a bit but it's the beginning probably so now what is we became really really popular are network meta-analyses okay which are different type a bit more complex but it's uh, for 20 years meta-analyses were like the type of design that got most isolations in the literature here you have uh, some slide about uh, the terminology and uh, i'll not go through because it's a uh, a bit academic uh, and you can find also the references uh, about uh, articles and book that uh, supports you in writing narrative and systematic reviews okay equator and uh, this is drum Rennie. uh it was the editor-in-chief of JAMA, okay, and it has a, this, a really nice quote that says that uh, whatever the rubbish that you wrote, you will find a place where to publish it, okay? I also remember that uh, uh, around 10 years ago, uh, I was working with Dramon, and uh, I wrote uh, papers in collaboration with Dramon, and uh, at the beginning of the discussion, I wrote, uh, this is the first paper that uh, address this issue. Okay, that's a classic starting point of the discussion. Uh, I thought that the paper was okay. Okay, he read the paper, arrived at the like, beginning of the discussion, and then he said, uh, yeah, very often researchers think that they are the first to think about or to have a nice ideas, but uh, really most often this idea has already been addressed by somebody else. It's not really convenient to start with this type of sentence that are really stereotypized. Okay, please remove my name of the authorships uh, and publish this rubbish paper. Okay, <laughs> so that was uh, how okay, it can go. So you need to really, really start to think about the writing of your papers and the quality of the reporting. These I will remove because I'm not, I don't know why I'm here. Uh, I have to look to the final part of the guidelines, sorry. Sorry, I need just two minutes to get another presentation.
Okay. Now, the last 10 minutes are about moving from systematic reviews to recommendations. And uh, uh, I'll speak a bit about the grade, okay? What is the grade? The grade is the new approach now to, to recommend, to uh, evaluate and assess the quality of the evidence and then to grade the recommendations. Okay, so when you move to guidelines, instead to have only the, uh, the evidence, the evidence synthesis, you want to grade the quality and then you want to grade the strength of the recommendations. Usually systematic reviews, they do not provide our recommendations. They provide uh, a clue about, you know, the efficacy or the safety of an intervention. But they do not say to doctors or to health professionals what to do. This is usually done in the guidelines and uh, the grade is a new system that you will see now to, to grade the evidence and the strength of the recommendations. Okay, and now we take an exa real examples that was done recently at the WHO. Okay, and this is the questions. Okay, the treatments for precancer cervical lesions. Okay, we are speaking about uh, the WHO guidelines, 10 systematic reviews to be developed. Okay, and the questions one from which we need to derive the recommendations, okay, is what are the effects of cryotherapy compared to not treatment? Do you know what is cryotherapy? Is that uh, easy? Okay. Is uh, to, we are speaking about uh, cervical regions, okay, precancerous, and cryotherapy is a system that may decrease, okay, the risk of reoccurrence of lesion, okay. Is the outcome important? Okay, would you prefer an out another outcome or so this is fine? This is fine, okay? So this is the question, this is the meta-analysis, okay? You know how to read and interpret these meta-analysis. Would you recommend now cryotherapy to reduce the number of precancerous lesions? Yes. Are you all agreeing with, yes, I would recommend the intervention? These are the real data, okay? And uh, the panel receives this type of data, exactly and then has to make the recommendation. So you are exact, exactly in the same positions as a panelist in uh, Geneva when it has to take the decision. Yes, do you agree that is, uh, we need to force the recommendation? So and so. Which one? We can use the control rate, 30% around, a bit more than 30%, but it's less safe to simplify 30%. That's the frequency, okay? We can have, uh, you know, probably in some, uh, in maybe in uh, some countries, it may be up to 40, in some other, it may be down to 20. Would this information really then change the recommendation, this is the benefit that you are seeing. So you would apply to any incidence then this benefit because this benefit comes from the two only randomized trials that were conducted.
Yeah, so, uh, but I, I mean, I agree, I, because these benefits, it would be different if it is applied to an higher prevalence, it would be, in, in terms of absolute numbers, it would be even bigger, okay? But this is a good, uh, like it's, uh, let's say that if we have a reduction, okay, a relative risk reduction that is almost 50%, okay? So if we look at the relative risk reduction, this is uh, quite, Ah, it's quite difficult to see this uh, type of relative risk reduction. But I, uh, oh yeah, it's about the quality. That's uh, another point. Yeah, we do not nothing about the quality of the studies. Okay, we have okay. I would say that we have some elements, okay, to be a bit skeptical about the quality of these two studies. What is that makes me a bit suspicious? La data, the data. Uh, uh, well, yes, you know, like uh, sometimes uh, an old bottle of wine is a good wine, it's still a good wine, okay? Uh, that's true also with studies. So I would uh, say that uh, the data, uh, the date gives me some, uh, yeah, it makes me suspicious because uh, I would say that these two studies were conducted in two different epochs, okay? And so even though I'm seeing that the, the heterogeneity is pretty low, I should assume that there is substantial heterogeneity. Okay, so my guess is that, okay, I look at the data, yes, the, there is a problem with the with the heterogeneity. The number of the studies actually, there are only two studies and they are not even big. The number of patients, okay, they are not really well balanced, okay. Uh, both uh, the two arms are above 30 patients, so above 30 patients, the randomizations start to be quite usually good, okay, over 100 is usually really, really good, and we see that there is quite a huge imbalance between the number of patients that have been randomized to the intervention and the control group, okay, so that makes me really, really uncomfortable, and uh, um, so this heterogeneity is probably due to the fact that we only have two studies and the power of the test that we use to, con to detect uh, how much heterogeneity we have is pretty low. So we, we cannot say that there is no heterogeneity, okay? And then the quality, we know nothing about uh, the design, how the outcome were assessed. Uh, so I would say that I am kind of s bit more suspicious about to recommend uh, these intervention. Which type of recommendation do we have? We have four types of recommendations. We have strong and weak positive recommendations, strong and weak negative recommendations, okay? A strong positive recommendations means that the intervention should apply to the vast majority of patients, okay? A weak recommendations means that the intervention should apply to, you know, like a, a good number, let's say at least 50% of the patients that we see, okay, and that's the opposite, okay. Even the strong recommendations doesn't mean that you have to apply the intervention to hold to 100% of the patients, okay. So what would be your recommendation? Choosing between these four types. Someone would go for a strong recommendation? No, it seems to me not. And if this is the only intervention available? No, because cryotherapy is one of the few interventions that we can adopt. There are also others, and so is one option of several. But if you think that now 
the panel at the WHO will decide about the, evol the Ebola vaccine, okay, they will decide with even less of this information and it may apply a strong recommendation, okay? So it's, it makes a multidimensional the problem, okay? But here I would say that weak recommendations, positive or negative, okay? That's the range of the shows that we can take. Why negative? The number of studies, the number of patients, also the, imp the imprecision. Uh, you know, the confidence interval are pretty large. They also arrive up to 93. It means that there is less than 10% of uh, a benefit, uh, okay, for an intervention that is uh, still invasive, okay? So it's not really, really, really an easy going intervention, okay? So you have to look. Uh, with just really, really few information, you can start to think about the recommendations and to use these elements to make your assumptions. The results is the risk ratio for a good is this, or what we see here, and the conclusions is that, is that a right conclusion? No, okay. It may be possible that cryotherapy reduce the risk, okay, but there's not nothing more than that should be conditional because we are really, really not sure, so, okay. We can decide then to make a strong recommendations, but we are not sure that it does reduce the risk of occurrence, okay. Now I fictionally change the results of the two studies, okay. Now if you look, uh, these are the same two studies, but now the scenario is changed. We I did change the numbers, uh, and then the overall results are again changed. What's your recommendation? Remember, you have four types, strong, positive recommendation, weak positive recommendation, weak negative recommendations, and uh, strong negative recommendation. Weak negative, okay? Weak or you agree? Well, yeah, we have some differences. The problem is a bit less compelling because we have less events. That's right. Okay. Less events, it means that in terms of absolute numbers, the benefit. Uh, if this benefit is true, okay, so if the true benefit is 23% relative reductions in terms of absolute numbers, we now have a less benefit compared to before is still a benefit. So our best guess, our best guess is that the intervention provides us, okay, 23% of risk reduction, okay, the confidence interval are pretty, pretty large, and so the, the estimates from these two studies are really, really imprecise. Uh, you know, like uh, we have still the same problems about the quality, about the years, uh, and uh, we now have the total that are a bit different and the randomization seems to work uh, better, okay? Particularly the first studies, you see that the total are 53, 49, okay? So it means that the randomization, if it's a simple randomization, is possible. So here, if you have 
remember that when you are part of a panel, you are forced to take a decision. Okay, so you are forced to make your recommendation. You cannot say, I'm not taking this recommendation. You base the recommendation on the information that you have. You discuss with the other panelists, you discuss with the methods, supporters, and then you decide. So, in your case, would you vote for a weak negative or for a weak positive? Weak positive. All weak positive. So if you rate uh, these, uh, these uh, scenarios with a weak positive, when would you rate an intervention for a weak negative? Do you agree that here we have a, a scenarios in which we have a lack of evidence of efficacy? Okay, it's not lack of efficacy. It's lack of evidence of efficacy. It may be quite a, a good results, okay, over 50% reductions, but we have now a lack of evidence, a lack of evidence. So with a lack of evidence, would you then recommend for the majority of the population, the intervention, no. So in these uh, type of scenarios, uh, you need to start to address the uncertainty, okay, but also deal with negative recommendation. The problem is that in medicine, we are not really prepared to deal with negative recommendations, and that's the problem with the panels. They always tend to arrive to positive recommendations even though there are not the conditions to uh, raise positive recommendations, okay? Although if this conclusion is correct, there was no significant difference in the risk of recurrence, okay, it is still inconclusive, the results. So this type of conclusions is really focused on the significance level why we want to focus the conclusions on the relevance. So we don't know if the intervention provides more benefits than arms, okay? The results may be of value because it's still 23 reductions, but we are very, very imprecise. We really need to have another trials, okay? Another trials providing us a definitive conclusions about this type of intervention, okay? You have then a few slides that go over the recommendation and how it works the grade, but substantially that's the exercise that you did is exactly what you did right now. And you can arrive actually to the, I wanna have an example, to these of type of evidence, uh, the evidence profiles in which you have the number of studies, the design, the limitation, the inconsistency, the direct and the precisions, okay. The number of patients is exactly what you see on the meta-analysis, the relative effects, the absolute effects and the quality and the importance of the outcomes. While you are part of a panel, you go over all these elements and then you take your decisions and you recommend or not the uh, intervention. Why guidelines are really, really important? Uh, because now they are a job. There are a huge number of people that are integrated in the panel team, okay, to work around the evidence, to present the evidence to the panelists, to the experts, and to take decisions, okay, this should be done at every country level uh, in Italy, even at the regional levels, so it means that there is a, a desperate need of people that can build and move panelists across these type of evidence tables, okay? So it's something that you may consider because in the future there will be 
a, a huge uptake by the systems to have uh, professional uh, workers included in this team. I handed my time. I'm pleased to take uh, last questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think that you have a, a break, I hope, for you. Okay? A very short break. Okay? Thank you very much.